Part 1 You will hear a telephone conversation between a customer and a shop assistant. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Good morning, Jenny Suit Rental. Jenny speaking. How may I be of service? Hi there. My name is Max Jones. That's J-O-N-E-S. And I'm looking to rent a suit out for a special occasion. Certainly, Max. We charge a set fee for our services. You can either choose from our designer range and pay £50 to rent your suit out, or choose from our standard range at a cost of £25. So, what will it be? Oh, the first option, please, Jenny. Uh, £25, did you say? Unfortunately not. The designer range is twice that price. Oh, in that case, I'll take the second option. Uh, standard, was that it? That's right. Now, before we go any further, may I ask how you intend to pay? Do you accept cheques? Yes, but only in exceptional circumstances. We prefer cash or credit card. Well, as I haven't got one, does this count as uh, those circumstances? Yes, that'll be fine. Make it payable to Jenny's Suit Rental. Will do. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. Now, Max, can I take your measurements, please, and a few details about what sort of suit you have in mind? Certainly. Let's start with the trousers, then, shall we? What is your waist size and leg length? I used to be 32 waist, you know, but these days it's more like 36. Too many cream pies. I've been there. And about the leg, 34? I wish. I'm afraid I'm somewhat lacking in the height department. Not even a 32. 30, I'm afraid. Never mind. As for the colour, could you do a dark grey suit? In fact, we have a very smart one of those in just your size. You're in luck. Now, what about shoes? Same colour? No, I think I prefer something darker. OK, let's go with traditional black then, shall we? What about size? Uh, I'm a size 45. Hmm. By my calculations, that's uh, 10 in our sizes. And style? What have you got? We do suede, nubuck and traditional leather. Definitely the last one. Very well. And will you be wanting a necktie? Do you do bow ties? Of course. I'll put one of those down in your order. Dark grey, I presume? Perfect. To match the suit. I think I fancy a light blue shirt, by the way. Might I recommend a green? Green would go very well with the suit you are renting. Light or dark? I'd say dark. Dark it is then. My neck size is 17 and a half. Uh, hard to believe that a little over a year ago I could fit into a 15, isn't it? Those cream pies again, right? You got it. Now, what about your suit jacket? Same colour as the trousers, obviously, but what size? Medium should be fine. You sure? Yeah. And have you got any of those three-button ones? I'm afraid not. The one- and two-button suit jackets are far more popular at the moment. In fact, the one button is all the rage. Let's have that one, then. No problem. Now. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two.
Part 2 You will hear a recorded message giving information about an area where tourists can visit to taste local food. First, you will have some time to look at questions 11 to 13. Now listen carefully to the first part of the message and answer questions 11 to 13. Welcome to the tourist information line for the Valley Food Trail. Here you will find many local food products for you to sample and buy. It is possible for you to spend as much or as little time as you want, but I suggest that you allow a full day for touring this area. Of course, there are many half-day tours available for those of you short on time. Now, it's quite a large area and stretches from Brookville to Ford Hill. For those of you unfamiliar with the area, that means that it is 10 kilometres to 35 kilometres from the city centre, or by car 15 minutes to the closest point, continuing to 55 minutes at its furthest point from the CBD. Of course, apart from food, there are many other places of interest in this area, including cafes and restaurants and galleries and studios. But I wouldn't recommend you go here to see parks and gardens. The other information lines will give you specific information related to these particular attractions. Before the final part of the message, you now have 20 seconds to look at questions 14 to 20. Now answer questions 14 to 20. But let's go back to food. If we begin in Brookville and head north towards Upper Valley in a clockwise direction, passing West Valley on West Road, we cross over Coast Road to come to our first place of interest, Magic Coffee. This is not to be confused with the coffee house, situated opposite on the other side of the valley on the railway line. Magic Coffee is next to the chocolate company, which is on the corner. Just past the ice cream shop on the corner of John Street is the fresh produce shop. A little further north, we have reached Ford Hill, where we can start our drive southwards along Great Northern Highway following the railway line. First, we come to the organic market near the corner of Memorial Avenue and then to Olive Farm opposite Olive Road. Just before we come to the next street crossing, we see the Honey Pot, which is practically opposite the coffee house. There is another chocolate company which sells nougat as well, just nearby. Following the railway line along Great Northern Highway, we return back to Brookville. Now, as I have said previously, if you only have a few hours to spare, there are several places that you shouldn't miss. The two chocolate places make equally nice chocolate, but the factory has the added bonus of nougat, unlike the company. Of course, everyone loves ice cream, especially unusual flavours such as coffee and nougat, so the ice creamery is definitely worth a visit. And while the coffee house sells expertly made hot drinks, including hot chocolate, I think your time would be better spent sampling the many products on offer at the organic market. Well, I hope you enjoy your time visiting the Valley Food Trail and enjoy all the wonderful local foods on offer. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear an introduction on the housing conditions in Chapmanville. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Listen carefully. Hi, I'm Gavin Murray. I'm the rental manager for the Central Chapmanville Real Estate Agency. I'm a real estate agent, much like any other, in that I help people buy and sell houses. But about half of my time is spent working to assist people in renting houses and flats. I've been in this business for a dozen years now, and I know the city very well in terms of which areas are the better places to live and how much it costs to rent in these areas. Now I normally divide Chapmanville into three areas in terms of rental prices. Generally speaking, the area in the northern part of the city is the low end of the spectrum, the cheapest housing. So, if you're looking to spend as little as possible on rent, I suggest you look there. The most expensive area would be the eastern part of Chapmanville. Most people think it's the prettiest part of the metropolitan area because of all the hills and parks. As so many people desire to live there, housing prices tend to be quite high. The middle market in terms of price for accommodation is found in the city's western and southern areas. Now let me give some examples of how much it will cost you to rent in these areas. Let's imagine you're a single person looking for a one-bedroom flat in Eastern Chapmanville. You would be paying no less than six hundred and fifty dollars a month for such a flat. You won't find anything for less than that. But a lot of people pay as much as one thousand one hundred dollars per month or more. The higher-priced flats are usually the ones in the hills, which run through the east. They've got the best views of the city. A similarly sized flat in the west of the city and the south, too, for that matter, would cost you at most six hundred and fifty dollars. But there are many flats going for less, and if you look around a bit, you can find one for as little as three hundred and fifty dollars. That's quite a reasonable rental price for most people. If you find that too expensive, I suggest you head to Chapmanville's north, where the cheapest flats are to be found. One-bedroom flats there start from about a hundred and seventy dollars a month and up to about four hundred dollars. Now, for those of you who want something bigger, you'll have to be prepared to pay about double those prices for a small two or three-bedroom house. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. For those of you who want something bigger, you'll have to be prepared to pay about double those prices for a small two or three-bedroom house. That goes for any of the areas I mentioned. Okay, so much for prices. What are the advantages and disadvantages of these areas? Well, I told you that the eastern part of Chapmanville is the prettiest. There are lots of parks and lots of trees all around there. Oh, I should mention that the only public transport in the east is the bus. There aren't any trains, so it's not that convenient, as you can imagine. Even though it's richer part of the city, in the south you've also got the river, but you won't find too many parks there because of all the factories alongside the river. In fact, there's quite a bit of industry in the south, which makes it a less desirable place to live. Still, the south is convenient because of public transport. The South has very good train services to the city centre, as well as buses, and that's why a lot of people choose to live there. I said earlier that western and southern parts of Chapmanville are about the same in terms of the price you pay for accommodation. They also have the same sort of public transport services, 
but the two areas are quite different in other ways. The west is next to the bay, so it's quite attractive in that sense. But there are a couple of problems with the west. One is that the bay is polluted, so polluted in fact that you wouldn't want to swim there. I used to take my family there about ten years ago, but now I wouldn't go near it. The other disadvantage of the west is that it is where the airport is, the Chapmanville International Airport. The noise can be quite annoying. Lastly, the north. In northern Chapmanville, as I said before, housing is cheap, quite cheap in fact, but you pay in other ways. For example, the area is very low and made up entirely of wetlands. It's beautiful in a way, but it attracts an incredible amount of insects for most of the year. The mosquitoes there are really bad. This makes things quite unpleasant, and so few people have any real wish to live there. But if money's a problem, that's the place to go. Just bring your insect repellent. Let me finish by again welcoming you all to Chapmanville and wishing you good luck in finding accommodation and settling down in whichever part of the city which suits you best. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture on the current and future use of mobile phones. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Okay. Now today we're looking at changes in communication, and specifically changes that have just happened or are likely to happen in the next few years. Key to this is the mobile phone, which is increasingly being seen as an all-purpose system rather than just a phone. If you only use your phone for texting and making calls now, you will be amazed at how you'll be using it in the future. The technology has been developed for a range of other uses. For example, phones could be used so that if you are meeting someone and they get lost, you could send them a map of your location to help them. This will save all those complicated explanations over the phone, and our poor friends or colleagues trying to drive and find out where they are at the same time. And if you get bored waiting, or if you're traveling, for example, you will soon be able to see TV news on your phone as it is actually being broadcast. This means that you won't have to miss any of your favorites if you are away for a few days. Most people have got used to texting now, and young people send pictures to each other. But what is exciting is the possibility of putting music with them before you send them, and it's not all frivolous. Phones are going to become even more critical in business and education. Some recent developments have a highly practical usage. So, for example, as lecturers, we will be able to send everybody a text to let them know if lectures have been cancelled. And the new phones could have a further use in education as well as business, as they will enable us to go to any destination, such as when we are doing a field trip, for instance. And from there to send data directly to a computer, so that we can access it when we get home. This means we will no longer be limited by what the phone can store.
And it's interesting to look at the different ways that men and women use phones now, as that does affect how the technology will develop. Some research has been done on how people use phones, and some of the results are surprising. One of the increasing usages of mobile phones is to get all sorts of data, such as phone numbers, the weather, train times, etc. And while there's been an attempt to set up connections with things that women might be interested in accessing, it is overwhelmingly men who do this. But what about the traditional use of a phone to speak to people? I suppose we would predict that it is mainly women who use phones as a method of contact for friends and family. But in fact, the genders exploit this facility equally. I've spoken about the increased business usages that phones will offer, and I suppose we would associate this usage with men. The survey picked up, though, that women are often working from home or catching up with work in the evenings, so they use phones in this way as much as men do. Most of us are aware we can store photos on our phones. It's an ideal method of capturing a moment wherever you are. Women tend to be the group that keep photos on their phones. But it seems that men use their phones to actually take pictures much more than women do, and of course, all this knowledge affects the marketing that the companies will do in order to sell. The that is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.